Welcome to, um, to everyone who's tuning in uh, for the second conversation in our Transformer State series on, uh, on digital government and human rights. And uh, as those of you, uh, of you who joined us for our last conversation will know, uh, we will aim with this series to focus specifically on case studies of digital government transformation in countries around the world and its implications for the protection of human rights. Uh, with an emphasis especially on innovation, what is uh, commonly referred to as the welfare state. For each conversation in uh, our monthly series, my colleague Victoria Adelman and I uh, will interview a human rights practitioner, academic or other expert uh, on a specific case study of digital government for about an hour, though we may go over five to ten minutes. Uh, and today we will discuss Kenya's uh, foundational digital ID system, the National Integrated Identity Management System, NIMS, uh, but also referred to colloquially as Huduma Namba. Uh, and this conversation uh, is recorded and made available on our YouTube channel uh, afterwards. Now our aim uh, with this series is to introduce a wider audience of human rights students, academics and practitioners and other interested people uh, to the implications of digital government for the field of human rights. And so in each conversation, we will look at both the promises and benefits of specific digital innovations in government, what is driving these changes uh, what these innovations entail, but also how it affects the power of governments and changes their interaction with individuals and what the risks and benefits are uh, from those changes uh, from the perspective of human rights. Now, one other goal we have with this series is to stimulate the formation of what we call a community of practice of those interested in digital government and human rights. And so through this conversation series, but also through a series of regular blogs by students and young academics on our webpage, uh, the sharing of relevant reports and other materials uh, on our webpage, we hope to informally bring together a network of activists, academics, and other interested individuals uh, committed to ensuring that digital government conforms to universal human rights standards. Now, I'm very excited that we have Nanjala Nayabula with us uh, here today, our second guest in this series, uh, with whom we will be discussing the case study of Huduma Namba in Kenya. And the central theme of today's conversation is the promise of efficiency and inclusion uh, that are used to justify the introduction of digital ID systems in Kenya as well as in other places. And we will contrast those promises with the messy realities of digitalizing the Kenyan state and its implications for the human rights of Kenyans, especially the poorest and most excluded among them. Uh, but before we begin, let me first introduce to you my colleague Victoria Edelman, together with whom I will interview uh, Nanjala today. Uh, she's a research scholar working with me on the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Proje Project at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice in New York. Victoria, over to you. Um, thanks very much, Christian, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Nanjala. Uh, so Nanjala Nyapala is a writer, political analyst and activist based in Nairobi. Her work focuses on African society and politics, technology, international law and feminism. In 2018, she published a fantastic book entitled Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Politics in Kenya. I recommend that you all read it. Um, she's also published extensively in academic and non-academic outlets, including Foreign Affairs, Al Jazeera and The Guardian. And Nanjala held a Rhodes Scholarship at the University of Oxford and holds a JD from Harvard Law School. Um, Nanjala, thank you very much for joining us today to talk about Huduma Namba. Um, this discussion is a lot more timely than we could have planned because the first biometric ID cards, so the Huduma cards, were issued um, just last week after quite some delays to the scheme. So I wonder if you could start by briefly introducing our audience to Huduma Namba. What is it and um, what does it do? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I guess the best way to think about the Huduma number is to think about it as the next stage in the genealogy of identity systems um, in Kenya that begin with the colonization process. So in Kenya, uh, Kenya has had mandatory ID cards since the formalization of the legal structures of colonization from 1920, uh, 1915 really, the Native Registration Ordinance. And it's gone through multiple iterations, um, but it has always had an element of biometrics, always had an element of ethnic collecting ethnic data. So the very first ID cards, the very first Kipandes were issued to men over the 
black men, African men over the age of 16 as kind of a way of uh, creating a pool of forced labor. So if you, you, it restricted the freedom of movement of black Africans within the colony. And if you broke the restrictions on freedom of movement and freedom of association circulation, if you didn't have your capacity and they around your neck, then you are not only liable to criminal punishment, but then a lot of that criminal punishment was forced labor, you know, working farms, um, sort of trying to get people corralling the black population. So it's important to know that the elements of violence, of structural violence, of discrimination, of um, unfair, unjust uh, punishments have always been embedded in the logic of ID systems in Kenya. Um, the Kipande system went through multiple iterations during the colonial period, even though it was only really about the 25 year period between 1915, 35 year period between 1915 and 1960. And so you had, first they opened it up to um, uh, white men as well. And then sort of um, opened it up to had like during the emergency period between 1952 and 1959 had special passes that were issued to people of certain ethnic groups to double down on that restriction of freedom of movement to double down on that restriction of freedom of association. When independence happened, the logic would have been that the system was repealed because it was literally the cornerstone of the colonial project. Instead, what you saw was that the government embraced it and actually made it a formal part of the government administration system. So it became mandatory for all men over the age of 18 to have an ID system. And then the, so that the gendered element was also embedded in that. Um, and, the the kipande in the the, the, the in, at independence is known as the kitambulisha, which in is Swahili for the identifier. You know, it's an ID card. Um, is mandatory for a lot of things that people in other countries might take for granted, um, especially with the rise of the terrorism um, in the region. You know, accessing buildings, opening a bank account registering for taxes, registering for buying a car, selling a car, buying property. It's really the cornerstone. It proves that you have a legal identity before the law. And so it's really interesting that women were not required to have an ID card in Kenya until 1978. And then they tried to lower the age, they raise the age from 16 to 18. And then sort of towards the end of the 1980s, there was a push to start digitalizing ID systems. And the first idea was basically to just take the Kipande and make it formal and make it, um, you know, incorporated into a database and, and things like that. Kitambulisha, sorry. Um, but what happened instead was that the, uh, with the advent of the digital, with the advent of this digital ID push locally and international, internationally, they, there was a layer that was added to that. So the Huduma number, the Huduma card is not just a form of identification, but it's a single source of truth ID that's supposed to give a 360 uh, degree legal identity to the Kenyan uh, citizen. It, it, the age limit is lower than the ID system. So you apply for an ID when you're 18, but the Huduma number you apply for when you turn six. It's available to both residents and non, uh, citizens and non-citizens, so people who are residents in the territory, um, foreigners, refugees, um, uh, ex expatriates, like anybody who is going to be present in the territory for a substantial amount of time. So it's more than just a, a, a legal identity. It's also a form of entitlement. Um, it's a form of, um, well, really surveillance and control layered over this history of structural violence and exclusion. Thanks for that introduction, um, Nanjal, and that history is uh, certainly um, very relevant. I would like to talk briefly about um, sort of the reasons behind introducing Hudomanamba uh, specifically. Um, and um, I think what you've seen in uh, Kenya, as with so many other digital ID systems in uh, other parts of the region, is uh, that efficiency and cost saving appear to be central aims underlying um, the government's move in that direction. Uh, so for instance, to quote from um, a high court decision uh, in uh, a challenge to Huduma Namba by the New Human Rights Forum, the Kenya Human Rights Commission and the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, uh, the government claimed that NIM seeks to capture and store data in a centralized database for effective and efficient administration, which will facilitate accountability in various forms and curb wastages of resources in line with Article 201 of the Constitution. Um, I'm wondering um, if you could sort of reflect on this uh, apparent aim of making government more effective and efficient through this new digital ID system. Yes, 
So to me, this is an expansion of one of the arguments that I make in my book, which is this false promise that technology is going to fix issues um, um, that people, that society has so far failed to, to fix for other reasons. So the promise of the efficiency argument rests upon the idea that the reason why governments haven't been building roads, hospitals, providing all of these services is simply because they don't have the information. And if they had the information, then, then they would be able to do all of this stuff better and, and deliver the services to people who need it. But if you unpack the social political conditions in countries like Kenya, you realize that efficiency is not the problem. And so to me, the Huduma number is very analogous to the IFNIS system, the integrated financial uh, management information system, which was launched to much fanfare um, and sort of rolled out across government departments in, the, in 2013, if I'm not wrong. And the idea of IFMIS was that it would centralize government procurement because the reason why Kenya was corrupt and all of this money, there was all this wastage and leakage within the government was because nothing was digitized. And so this, that it would make everything more efficient, make everything more transparent, it would make everything more accessible. So it's really interesting that, you know, a few years, three or four years into the rollout of IFMIS, the Auditor General basically disavowed it. And he said, you know, this thing is neither integrated, nor does it help me manage anything. Mm -hmm. It made everything much more opaque. It made, him, made it much more difficult for him to track um, who was launching transactions, who was, um, you know, set, transferring money, where the money was going. In fact, it not only consolidated the leakages, but it also made them incredibly be difficult. It made everything much more opaque, it made them incredibly difficult to track. And this is really an example of how the efficiency argument can be a misrepresentation of much more complex social political phenomena and is a way of displacing authority, is a way of displacing responsibility, sorry, and is a way of displacing um, uh, the difficult conversations towards, you know, techno uh, solutionism, that if we just throw technology at the social problem, then everything is going to be fixed. The mm -hmm. reason why there are inefficiencies in governance in Kenya is not because there is no data. It's not because there is no information. Every 10 years, for example, we have a decennial census. We just had one in 2019. It's the biggest um, enumeration exercise in the entire country. The efficiencies, so the government knows, and the government can find you, you know, even if you are in Turkana, you're 400 kilometers away from the largest town, a census enumerator will come and they will find you. What has the government done with that census data? Have we ever seen any shifts towards in policymaking, any shifts in, in um, investment, any shifts in, you know, just anything tangible that we can say that having this information, having more data has enabled the Kenyan government to do X, Y, Z. Has it enabled, for example, hospitals to be built where they're needed the most? Has it enabled an expansion in schools? Has it enabled investments in education? Has it en enabled mm -hmm. investments in health? It hasn't. So the efficiency is not a problem. And framing date, lack of data as the main obstacle towards efficiency is a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy that needs to be, to be forestalled. We need to stop mm -hmm. and think, um, tech can't fix everything. Lack of data isn't always the problem. Sometimes the problem is much simpler than that. And therefore the solution that is required is much more elegant than that. And the techno solutionism isn't, on, isn't just going to obscure from the real solutions, the necessary solutions, but it's also going to divert resources from where they are needed the most. Up to this point, the Huduma number, the government has used $6 million, or so 6 billion Kenya shillings on the Huduma number project. So far, the government has issued 12 Huduma numbers, cards, one, two, for a population of 47 million people. So what isn't being paid for in a year in which we, in, in, a, in a sort of three-year cycle in which we've had a devastating drought in which schools have collapsed, more or less collapsed and universities have more or less collapsed because of the pandemic, in which we have 518, an estimated 518 ICU beds in the middle of a pandemic and no efforts to expand that, no discernible effort to expand, you know, healthcare provision mm -hmm. in, in an emergency. What isn't getting done because the six, million dollars is being spent on this project is also part of the, the the calculation of costs and benefits of the initiative so just following up on on, on cost and benefits um what you're saying here is that this claim of more efficient more effective government uh is false you cannot necessarily achieve that goal through um gathering more data and using digital systems to process that data 
But let's assume that the government is serious about uh, using Huduma Namba uh, to make government more effective and efficient. To what extent has it tried to um, uh, justify the expenditure, for instance, the six million by undertaking um, uh, an, an in-depth series analysis of the costs and, and benefits? Has there been a cost and benefit uh, analysis that has been made public? And, and if so, what does it look like? Does it really take into account uh, not just the production of the card and uh, and some direct benefits for government itself, but does it also take into account uh, the various costs that are imposed on citizens? For instance, the time spent on registering for uh, Huduma Namba and other and other costs. So there, there are multiple layers to government decision making, and some of them are are accessible to the public, and so you can sort of parse through them as a researcher, and some of them are not accessible to the public. Um, certainly at a legislative level, the case has not been, in my view, the case has not been adequately made. And the easiest way to see that is to go to the Huduma Number website and see what information is up there and see how it is all couched in vague promises and and you know and it's even if you believe the promises so even if you suspend disbelief and say well i'm going to agree with you xyz it means something that the national interests that the huduma number is tied to are linked to the campaign promises of this very specific administration because what that says is that this is a political initiative this is not linked to broader um, national aspirations it's not grounded promises that have been made by this administration and you can't make national policies based just on you know what this administration what the legacy of the current president is going to be you have to make national policies looking 20 years ahead 30 years ahead, even if we're not in power, what is this going to look like? The fact that the Huduma number is hinged on the big four promises that were kind of um, um, sold as or promised as um, policy attainments for this administration in the, after winning the last election is a red flag. Moving beyond that, the public case for the Huduma number has not been made. In fact, what has happened is we've been told about this card under barrage of threats. Um, if you don't register within the next 30 days, we're going, you're not going to be able to get a passport, you're not going to be able to get, that is a continuation of this legacy of violence, of structural violence against citizens. And the idea that the state, that your legal identity is not a, a right, but your legal identity is actually something that is forced upon you by an authoritarian state. That's another red flag. Why did the government, if you're offering people an entitlement that you can make the case for, that you can justify, why do you need to resort to threats? So what we've seen is a lot of um, rhetoric that tries the Huduma number to very specific cases, but not really an elaborate that actually is, here is the problem, here is the gap, here is the policy gap that we're looking at, and this is how this comes to breach that gap. We've seen a lot of speeches, of, uh, but the very kind of thorough breakdown that you would want to see that would say, you know, our, our ex experts have looked at, for example, example, have noted I think we're having an issue with at your this particular um, that at this particular level can be resolved by having this X this oh no uh, we, we, we switched off your video um, uh, Najala because um, the connection was a bit slow for a moment there I think I'm going to do the same and stop my video it's for uh, the best here. So we have a better connection. I know it's uh, becoming rush hour in uh, in Nairobi in terms yeah. of internet traffic. Uh, should anything like should your connection fail, you can always call in um, uh, via the separate phone number uh, in the in the Zoom invitation. Um, but sorry, uh, please continue. We we missed the last thirty seconds or so. What you were saying. Test, test, one, two, one, two. Yeah, I can hear you. There you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's always the tech. It's always the, your internet. Um, so where did I, where did I start dropping off? 
Test, test, one, two, one, two. Yeah, I can, I can still hear you. Sorry, um, I had muted myself. Uh, I obviously okay. forgot to, forgot to <laughs> unmute myself. Um, um, so you were talking about sort of the um, authoritarian tendencies uh, and, and, and threats behind um, um, this project and uh, how that's been driving sort of registration um, and, uh, and, and then you dropped off. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, maybe I'm just a, um, an idealist uh, and an optimist, but I do believe that if you, if you are offering citizens a service and you're able to articulate a strong public case for the service that you're providing, you don't need to resort to threats. You don't need to resort to intimidation in order to make people sign up. People will sign up because they will see the benefit. So for example, we don't have to blackmail people and threaten people into signing up for passports. We don't have to blackmail or threaten people into signing up for um, the ID card, for driving licenses, because the benefits are very clearly articulated. And it's very clear for citizens to see why why this is important for them to have. The fact that both the ID system and the Huduma number system and that the uptake of them is not is, is contingent on intimidation and threats of loss of service and th threats of denial of service is a red flag to me. It really symbolizes this failure to convince that you have failed to convince the citizens that what you're doing is actually for the best. And um, what I would love to see is a very detailed breakdown uh, of you know state service provision and what you're talking about is a cost benefit analysis to say this is where lack of data causes problem problems this is how it ha having more data would solve that problem this is how much that would co would cost and we really haven't seen that we really haven't had that um, breakdown and I think that's a red flag. Just very briefly before we move to the next part of the uh, of the conversation. Um, if the government feels that it needs to resort to threats to get people uh, uh, to sign up, do you think that's an indication that they don't really believe in this promise of uh, efficiency and effectiveness uh, themselves? So in other words, there's some other reason why they want people to sign up and uh, effectiveness and efficiency are just there sort of in terms of uh, public relation exercises? Um, or do you think that they believe in that promise, uh, but they just haven't fully realized uh, the complexities of actually integrating Huduma Namba in Kenyan society. So is it naivete or is there something else going on? Or like what, what explains that efficiency and effectiveness can be found in almost every explanation of why they're doing, uh, why they're introducing this system? I think it's, you know, this is like political uh, science, political theory sort of uh, fundamentals. And I think from, from a fundamental level, it's important to remember that the state is a complex agent and that's not always working with a unified intent and that there might be multiple um, facets to the state intent embedded in a single action. So I think that on a bureaucratic level, there are people who genuinely are convinced that the, the efficiency is a noble pursuit. And I call this, you know, the McKinseyfication of governance that um, because of this pervasive uh, management consultant approach to especially developing countries, especially reorganizing the fundamentals of development, developing countries, that there are people who, who have drank the Kool-Aid and who genuinely believe that efficiency is the most important um, pursuit, you know, in terms of, of governance and in terms of organizing um, societies. Um, but then there is a there is another branch to this, which is the political branch of it. And this is uh, Nanjala, you're dropping out again. Pol political with a capital P. These are people, for example, who are appointed whose professionals survive Oh la la. Is that I, better? I, I can I can I, hear you now again. Sorry, you were you were gone for, for like 10 seconds just now, but I can hear you again. Okay. Well, Kenyan internet, you've disappointed me. <laughs> um so um on the other side, you have people whose professional survival is contingent on satisfying the, uh, the, the demands, the claims, the, the pressures of people who are elected officials. And I think that's where this much more sinister um, uh, aspect sort of starts to manifest, which is why do politicians need white elephant projects? Why do people who have to go to the ballots every five years need these big flagship? Because it's not just the Hujuma number, it's also the SGR, it's also the, um, uh, the Lamu port, it's also the Lapset highway. Why are all of these 
what what social, economic, political function do mega projects serve in countries like Kenya? And the short answer is that they are avenues, they're opportunities for accumulation. And so that is also part of, of the matrix that must be studied. And that's why whenever I, I tell people, you know, I'm not a techie, I don't, I don't break apart the technology. What I look at is politics. And what I look at is how power uh, thinks with the Hujuma to keep applying this uh, uh, complexity framework and see that there is multiple motivations. There are bureaucratic motivations, there are political motivations, but the sum total of those uh, motivations is that this project needs to be handled with restraint and it needs to be questioned much more thoroughly. Thank you very much, Nanjala. That's that's excellent. Um, I'd like to go to the specific exclusions that have been happening here. Um, so just to go back to what you already said about the history of um, this system and the previous systems, um, you mentioned that there's this gendered element here and Haduma Namba seeks to include women and girls. So I wonder how colonialism, racism and exclusion of certain groups um, has been baked into these systems and how Haduma Namba might be any less exclusionary. Um, the, the, so the embedded in the logic, as I said in the beginning, embedded in the logic of ID systems in Kenya was always an element of racism. It was always, a, a, the point was always to create a punitive biometric registration identity system that would make it easy for the colonial state to create a pool of forced labor, to be able to make the colony economically viable. Um, I, we have a paper sort of working its way through the, the academic journal system right now. But one of the arguments that we make in that is we, we look at the, the records, the Hansard records and the legislative records and the conversations that people were having in parliament. And you see that the specter of suspicion, the specter of some people must be excluded in order for the state to function, the specter of um, that, that there are some people who are more Kenyan than others doesn't go away. And this is really the physical manifestation of this is the vetting process. And there are people who have written much more eloquently about this. There's a lot of research that's, that's been done about this because as I said in the beginning, the ID system, the Kitambu Lisho, even though in the legislative and the political theory of Kenya, it is mandatory and anybody who demands an ID before the state should be able to get one. In practice, people who are from what are called border communities, all over Kenya's borders. And it's important to recall that every single border in Kenya, except the border with Tanzania, has an element of contestation. Um, border com people from border communities have to go through a process known as a vetting. And vetting basically means that you have to go back to the village where your grandfather, your great, and it's always a father because this, the patriarchy is embedded in the logic. You go back to the village where your father or your grandfather, um, great grandfather was born, you find the local chief and you have the local chief basically write a paper and say, you are the person that you say you are. If you've lived, and this applies to everybody, it applies to people who have lived in urban areas. It's, you know, I had to go to vetting because my family is from the border. And you have to, if, you know, if there are people who have lived in Nairobi since before colonization, but because their ethnic identity, because they happen to be ethnically Somali or ethnically Maasai or ethnically um, uh, Luya or ethnically Kisi, whatever, the, the logic of ethnic exclusion means that they have to go through vetting much more than the person who has never set foot in the city before, but happens to be from an ethnic group that is from the center of the country. So there's that two tiered ethnic system that's embedded in the logic of identity layer that with the racism, layer that with, and Kenya has a significant Asian population that also has a hard time getting ID cards. We have a significant um, uh, population of people who, you know, have to reach a higher standard of proof to prove their legal identity in order to access what is in theory an entitlement. The Huduma number doesn't address any of that. And if you follow the legislative debates on Sorry, we've lost you there again. Betting. You'll see that the idea that, that people from a to, to cheat the state, that's 
discrimination. That is prima facie discrimination. And it's embedded in the ID system. And the Huduma number doesn't address that because it grafts on all of these ideas of betting, of proving you know, that your grandfather is X, Y, Z and comes from this village and da, 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 da. All of that is still carried on. That hasn't changed at all. It's just become digital. Um, but there's another layer to this, and, and you know, researchers like Karen Weitzberg, um, Corey Rogers, they've been doing research with refugee populations. And the, the, it, what is emerging from their work is that this digitization of identity consolidates exclusion of people. I and mean, you have people who, for example, registered as uh, Somali ethnic, uh, people who are ethnically Somali who registered as refugees because as citizens, they were not able to access basics, food, education, and healthcare. And so they falsely or wrongly registered as, um, as refugees and now are unable to claim their Kenyan ID system, their Kenyan ID card. And there are these kinds of very uh, unique forms of exclusion that refugees are facing vis-a-vis -vis the digital system or children of refugees or um, people who um, maybe are not refugees but happen to live in communities where refugees are, are a big part of the population. A lot of these inequalities are being um, locked in to the system because they're not being addressed. They're just being made, quote unquote, more efficient. Then there are groups like the Nubians. And again, you know, we've seen some people are doing some fantastic research with Nubian communities, but um, the Nubians are soldiers, Sudanese, ethnically South Sudanese uh, communities that came over in the pre-independence era um, and fought for the British, for the colonial administration in the war on independence. As, and the promise, part of the promise was that they would be settled, that they would be given land, that they would be able to stay in the territory as full citizens. And of course the British lost the war of independence, um, but the promise of, so the promise of land and the promise of being permanently settled in the country was suspended. And you have third generation, fourth generation Nubians um, in Kibra, primarily in Kenya, but in other parts of the country who can't get ID cards because they're Nubian. Like the, 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 the denial of this entitlement and the denial of this opportunity hinges on their identity. So it is fundamentally um, discriminatory. Um, Nubian people, you know, when you hear the stories, when you have the conversations, you, you hear people who will say, we weren't able to get a death certificate. We weren't able to get a marriage certificate. We weren't able to register this birth. We weren't able to register all of these because we're not allowed to get ID systems. And that's why the Nubian community took the Huduma number to court because there's nothing in the Huduma number system that says we are going to undo this history of discrimination. You still have to have an ID card. You still have to have a form of identification in order to get the Huduma number. So what we're, we're doing is we're compounding that discrimination, we're compounding that exclusionary logic um, and, and making, it, making it much more solid because it is um, the promise, the, because of the false promise of digitization. And the final layer of, of exclusion is what we've seen in India, which is that there are classes of people whom, because of the way in which biometrics have been defined as part of our identity, the fact that you have to have 10 fingerprints and you have to have an iris scan and you have to have all of these things. Those are, those are um, philosophical, uh, um, that's, an, that's an epistemological argument about what makes up a person's identity. That, you know, fingerprints, if you don't have fingerprints, you don't exist. That's an epistemological, epistemological argument. And what we've seen with Adhar in India is that there are many people who don't have fingerprints for various reasons. There are people, for example, and Kenya is, you know, has large rural communities where you have women who will lift, um, you know, hot sufurias, hot saucepans off the stove because they don't have oven mitts and they don't have, you know, special protective gear and they'll burn off their fingerprints from doing that for 50, 60 years. There are people who work far. The people who are um, you know, day after day, day after day. And what we saw in India was that this was not a small because these are predominantly rural communities. There has been no interrogation of that epistemological basis for what identity is. There hasn't been, you know, in the same way that you can say with, with signatures that you can have a signature, you can use your fingerprints, you can. There hasn't been that epistemological unpacking of 
what if our notions of biometrics and our notions of identity are inherently flawed and cannot be applied to communities that do not resemble the urbanized European, urbanized Asian societies where these risks of losing these markers of identity is not as high. That's an important question that the Huduma number doesn't even touch. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important element as well in terms of um, kind of totally different concepts being imposed. And, and you mentioned um, access, uh, so, such as to marriage certificates, um, but also healthcare and kind of, I want to go to these more tangible um, exclusions that are happening from, from services. So just last week, as we mentioned at the beginning, the government published rules that guide the implementation of the digital ID system. And um, Article 10 underlines that the NIMS database will be the single source of truth in government, as you've mentioned. It says that any government agency requiring, per requiring personal particulars of an individual shall, at the first instance, rely on the NIMS database to authenticate the foundational data of an enrolled resident individual. So I'm wondering if any government authorities are already making the provision of services conditional on obtaining a Huduma number or a card and how you expect this to ex increase exclusion from social rights like social benefits or health care. Um, yeah, thank you. So the short answer is um, the text says a lot. Um, but the practice is completely different because what happened with the last case uh, with the, the, the Nubian um, Council versus the cabinet secretary, the attorney general, basically, um, was that they said that they had to stop the process of registering and rolling out the Huduma number until a data commissioner was appointed. So basically, these rules are inconsistent with what the court has said, which is stop put the data protection, put the data privacy structures in place, and then we can come back and have this conversation. So the process of appointing a data commissioner is, is, is ongoing. Um, I think she was announced last week or week before last. Um, she does not have an office. She doesn't have an agency. She doesn't have regulations. And, and so really making this mandatory at this particular point would be a breach of the, the court's holding in that case. Um, in practical terms, the government tried to do this with the census last year. There was a legal challenge to that. They were forced to walk it back. They tried to do it with the passports, with the digital passports. There was a, there was a, a, a political challenge to that. They had to walk it back. Um, they have tried to do it with the taxation. There was a challenge to that. They have to walk it back because basically every you, you, there are processes to making laws. There are processes to rolling out and making things mandatory and the government has ignored its own processes. So at this particular point, any demand that the Huduma number precede an actual service is not legal, it's not lawful. And it has to be, it has to go back to, and because that case is also under appeal. Right, so the, the Nubian Council appealed and, and a group of people have appealed that decision. So we're waiting to see how the court will come down on that. Um, yeah, so that's that's the, that's the long answer is that it's it says it's, it's a demand, but based on what? Yeah, thanks for thanks for clarifying. And um, before we go to the QA, I just wanted to um, briefly ask you two questions on the role of human rights in the debate on uh, Huduma Namba in, in Kenya. Um, we were lucky to have you as a guest at the, at the center before uh, uh, for debate on techno racism and human rights in, uh, in, in late July. And uh, there you spoke about three ways in which you saw human rights law and human rights vernacular as helpful in the debate on, uh, on techno racism. And just to summarize what you said, you said, first, I see them as pathways to accountability for injustices, both local and international, legal and non-legal. Uh, second, you saw human rights as a language that translates domestic issues into transnational discourse. Um, uh, thereby transporting uh, a way of thinking from one place to the next. And finally, you talked about human rights as uh, having a genealogical function, so archiving injustices over time and uh, allowing for the emergence of patterns uh, over time. Now, if you uh, take into account what you said before, assuming you still stand by what you said in, uh, in July, <laughs> August, um, because I constantly change my mind, so I wouldn't hold that against you. Um, could you reflect a little bit about how human rights then, both as legal norms and uh, as uh, a social justice language, have played a role in the debate on Huduma Namba so far, if, if any? I think for me, as, as a person who is um, 
observer, but also participant in, in Kenya's human rights space. I think I'm really inspired by the grassroots campaign that the Nubian Rights Council has organized around this and have, have managed to bring allies domestically, internationally, regionally, and be starting to articulate a regional language of digital rights and a legal language of, of identity rights. And I think that, um, yeah, we're absolutely seeing, and this is what has pushed some of our research and some of the conversations on linking the Huduma number to the Kipande system, which is not something that had happened. It's not something that people were thinking. You know, people, many Kenyans, until the Huduma number, had not interrogated the colonial history of the ID system. You know, we just accepted it that it was you turn 18 and you go and apply for an ID and Somalis have a hard time getting IDs and, you know, Maasai's have a hard time getting IDs and nobody had really started to see this as a much more systemic issue. And so the, the challenge that went to court and the activism that happened around that has done what I said about building a genealogy of demanding visibility and demanding rights and demanding respect and, and protection before the law. We're starting to see a much more sophisticated conversation within the human rights community about what identity is and what identity is supposed to do. We've seen lawyers um, who wouldn't ordinarily be in uh, a history space or political science space articulating arguments that are being made by activists and by researchers and by historians in a very sophisticated way. So I think that on, on the genealogy point, it's definitely happened. It's tremendous that we're starting to see that history being used to argue for a different way. Um, and then the transnational point, absolutely. I mean, the amicus briefs from Privacy International and the amicus briefs from um, Article 19, all of this is part of the transnational conversation because, and, and it links the, both the transnational and the genealogical point because now we have, you know, British company, British um, nonprofits, British uh, human rights organizations starting to question why the UK can vote to scrap ID systems, like they, they tried to introduce them and people said no, but why British uh, companies can be involved in the process of launching ID systems in the developing world? Why is it good enough for the colonial, for the colonized states, but not good enough for the colonizing state? And so that transnationalism is giving us a much more robust argument because we're saying there must be something wrong with the system. If in 2010, I think it was 2014, British citizens can vote wholly against having a national ID system, but we in Kenya have to get one imposed on us by force. By force. Um, and yeah, we are, we are seeing the digital rights argument and the human rights argument giving us a pathways um, to accountability. We've seen, you know, the idea of the, Nub the Nubian Rights Council of people who don't even, you know, majority of them don't even have the legal right, legal identity before the law using the court system at this level and using grassroots activism and coming together with Somali grassroots groups, with Maasai grassroots groups, with all of these marginalized groups um, is a new use of the law. It's a new use for you know, these pathways. Um, we're, try we're seeing new forms of activism and new forms of advocacy. Mm -hmm. So all of this is to say that yes, the digital ID argument and the ID, the identity, the Huduma number argument has given a new um, impetus and sort of revived a lot of these human rights conversations that had for a long time been in abstraction, had for a long time been professionalized, uh, preponderance of lawyers sort of being an insider outsider conversation or the other extreme of government saying, we are just gonna make you do it. You don't have anything. You don't get to say anything. You don't get to push back. I think that's a really good development. Just a, a, a quick follow up on that, on some of the benefits that have come out of this, including sort of the renewed spotlight on, uh, on ID systems and exclusion. Um, I wonder if one of the other benefits potentially is that digital ID in Kenya is a sort of cross government initiative. So it affects social rights, it affects the right to privacy, right to vote. Has it in any way um, enabled the human rights movement to uh, sort of organize better or to coordinate better because it involves so many different human rights issues that it's perhaps sort of a catalyst or a, a focal point for different types of organizations to come together and jointly uh, voice opposition against this plan? I would say um, it's mixed. The human rights uh, system in Kenya has faced a lot of challenges 
Um, after the 2007 election, a lot of people who were very active in the human rights space, 2013 election, sorry, a lot of people went into government. And so we lost a lot of good people. We've also had the same process that you see in other countries whereby there is a over, there's a, there's a dependence, a, a heavy dependence on the law as the, as the tool. And so the other sort of muscles in the body, if you will, um, the grassroots organizing, the mobilization, protest, all of that have atrophied considerably because everything has kind of been consumed by this idea that if we just get a good law, then we don't have to do everything else. So it's very difficult to outright say that um, the developments have, that the human rights community has mobilized and unified and is, is um, you know, is taking this on and is really is really sort of doing tremendous work on this. Um, that is not to diminish what is being done, especially by grassroots groups. I think, like I said, what the Nubian Rights Council, what you know, the Haki, um, I think it's called uh, Hakim Tani or um, Haki Nashiria. You know, there are all of these Muhuri, all of these grassroots facing groups have actually really done what you're talking about. They've taken this as a moment to consolidate their position, to consolidate minority rights groups in Kenya have done tremendous work of putting this on the agenda and of mobilizing resources to, to put it on everybody's agenda so that it's it's the, everybody can see how it affects them too. So there is, it's a mixed bag. And I think the, the bigger organizations and more resource, the better resource organizations can certainly do more. And of course, better resourced in Kenya is relative. I mean, the shrinking space for civil societies is, is an international problem. Um, uh, we don't, many of our big organizations are dependent on foreign funding and there's very little um, domestic uh, funding sources for rights advocacy. And as a result, um, the groups have much less autonomy in terms of setting priorities and in terms of um, working in an organic way. And so with that caveat, I think that the, the bigger organizations can certainly do more to support the brave work that's being done by, by groups like Hakina Sharia, by groups like the Nubian Rights Council, groups like Muhuri, um, to really put digital rights on the political agenda in Kenya. Thanks very much. Um, and so we're going to go to questions from the audience now. We've had quite a few come in um, and we have two that are relating to the motivation of, of different actors. Um, so firstly, does the Ministry of Health have a collaboration or a stake in the system? Was there foresight to include Ministry of Health concerns into this program or proposals for the Ministry of Health um, about planning to use data from Huduma Number? Um, and secondly, to what extent is the Kenyan government locked into this ID system by the fact that it is financed by the World Bank and perhaps other development agencies? Mm, I love that question. Um, Ministry of Health, um, as far as the public information goes, what we know is that the WordPress site and I use WordPress for my website. So this is not a slight on WordPress. It's more of a slight on the Kenyan government because why is the official Huduma number website a WordPress site? Um, but the officially healthcare is one of the pillars um, of the Huduma number system. And so it's supposed to, the, the political, the policy promise was universal healthcare and that universal healthcare has, was one of the, what is called the big four agenda. And so in principle, the Huduma number is supposed to be one of the enabling conditions for the healthcare um, uh, agenda, for the universal healthcare agenda. In practice, the universal healthcare um, agenda has been launched and relaunched. I think we're heading into the third launch later this year. Um, there are some things that have done that have gone well. For example, I spoke to, I've spoken to people in informal settlements who speak very highly of the um, uh, I'm forgetting the name right now, but it's it's the maternal, there's a project to reduce maternal mortality that allows women to deliver in any public hospital for free. Um, the women in informal settlements speak very highly of this, of this project. Um, but again, in practice, remember that there's a case and there's a litigation and there was a court decision that said, you cannot demand this number until the data privacy and data protection systems are in place. So it's very difficult to say that this is happening because the Huduma number happened, or this is not happening because the Huduma number happening because the Huduma number is not supposed to be happening. Um, 
the the government information sharing information across government agencies has always been a very interesting thing. Like I said, things like IFMIS were supposed to make this easier, um, digitization of uh, all these databases is supposed to be easier, but we can't look at digitization projects in abstraction. Our analysis has to also look at the social political conditions in which these projects are being launched. And the social political conditions for digitization in Kenya is that there is rampant state corruption, is that there is rampant bureaucratic inefficiencies, but not in the, in the way the government wants it, but in that there's a lot of friction that is not about lack of data, that is a la lack of will. And so wherever the digitization projects have been launched, they've always had this half-baked, you know, launched to big fanfare, poorly implemented. Launched to big fanfare, abandoned halfway through. Launched that stands to benefit immediately from this consolidation of, of information is the security agencies, is the surveillance state. The only people who will capitalize on this, um, who seem to be in a position to capitalize on this process is the security apparatus. Um, in terms of the World Bank, the ID4D is, an, is, is, an, is a World Bank project. It's a World Bank initiative. They're not just doing it in Kenya, they're doing it in, in countries all over the world, um, providing funding for digital ID systems. And the rhetoric is, is evident in you know, projects like the Huduma number, but you know, in India, in Madagascar and other countries. Um, and it's 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 a, it's one of the World Banks and the uh, the Bretton Woods system. It's one of their priorities. And you know, again, I keep going back to this idea of McKinseyfication, and the the management consultant approach to governance is one that is embed it's is loaded with a lot of fallacies and is loaded with a lot of short termism and is doesn't necessarily see societies in their whole sense because you know. This is, I guess, for people who do institutional theory and for people who do political science theory at that level is to really, um, what happens when the metrics for success within the multilateral organization are inconsistent with the political social realities of the countries where these projects are being rolled out? And I'm not the first person to make this argument. I think people who have studied um, the, the good governance, the, 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 what is it, the Washington consensus have made elaborate um, and very, very sophisticated arguments about how this, this is a false promise embedded in this, that research done in Washington, um, that thinking that is developed in Washington in abstraction to be rolled out in countries halfway around the world with a disproportional power dynamic between the Bretton Woods institution and the government necessarily compound issues before they solve them. And, and, and as, a, as an activist, you know, just putting aside my academic hat, as an activist, I really do think that this is something that needs to be thought about much more um, deeply than what we've seen. Just because it looks good in Washington doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good. And what is the plan B if the project, like what we saw in India, what is the plan B if the project actually compounds harm rather than solves it? Excellent. In fact, um, you've mentioned India, and one of the questions is about this, uh, the Adhar system in India. Um, in fact, the um, case that we've been talking about that was brought with the Nubian Rights Forum, um, in addition to others, um, brought in experts from India to kind of talk about that. And um, one attendee is asking, to what extent do you think that the Adhar system in India, which the Haduma number system is loosely based on, is useful for helping us to think about what might happen in Kenya? Um, and another um, question as well, relating to what you were talking about with surveillance, um, is one person has asked, data is the new gold. What, in your view, is the worth of our data to government? Uh, I'll take those questions in reverse. I, I hate that statement. I hate that statement, data is the new gold. I hate it. And I've written um, somewhere um, uh, with the Heineck Boll Foundation about why this is a really, really dangerous statement to make. 
Um, we have to really stop um, this. We keep stumbling into these crises with digitization because there is this false belief that this is the first time that this has happened. That because computers didn't exist before, you know, 1980 or 1960 or whatever, that the underlying social political condition, the underlying social political um, tensions have never been seen before. Um, when you say that we're going to build a system to make a government more efficient, uh, you know, take out all of the jargon, take out all of the fancy language, all of the things that obscure, all of the you know policy um, jargon, and just do take the raw argument. We're going to make the government more efficient. Then follow-up question has to be: At what? What is it that the government has done and has been doing that will be made more efficient? And so this is, for example, the discrimination argument, right? That if discrimination is embedded in the logic of state practice in Kenya, and you're saying you're going to make the government more efficient, then you're going to make the government more efficient at discrimination. That political, that philosophical argument doesn't get made because we have um, taken the, the, the humanities, the sort of human side of all of these arguments out of the equation. And so to, the, to start the process of bringing that human side into the equation of bringing the humanities thing. We cannot overly simplify people's existences to data points. We are not just data points. We are people, we are family, we are friends, we are um, farmers, we are teachers, we are lawyers, da, 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 da. What happened with Adhar when Indian people were reduced to data points and fingerprints and biometrics was that thousands of people committed suicide because they couldn't capture the data in the way that it was envisioned by the data czars. Their data couldn't be captured. They didn't have the right biometrics. They were not able to access their benefits and their entitlements, and therefore they got frustrated and they killed themselves, right? Because we are not just data points. We are complex. And the point of government is not to overly simplify the human experience. The point of government and governance is to use, to leverage the resources, the vast resources that governments have by that they collect, you know, through taxation, that they collect through administration, to leverage those resources to maximize the human experience, to help people have better quality lives. If there is any lesson that this pandemic has taught us is that we have to stop this overly simplified analyses that bleed people of their complexity. How can a government that was able to spend 6 million US dollars on an ID system not be able to provide more than 518 ICU beds? It's the same government. And just because you're talking to the Minister of Education in a boardroom, or the Minister of Health in a boardroom, and selling him the jargon of, of efficiency and efficiency and efficiency, doesn't mean that all this other stuff doesn't matter. So I hate that phrase, data is the new gold. I hate that phrase, data is the new oil, because I don't like this idea, this overly uh, dystopian idea of flattening the human experiences to just data points. We are not just data points. We are not resources to be exploited in that way. We are not to be uh, monetized in that way. We do not exist and serve at the pleasure of the state. We are people. And governments who have money and time and resources must be focused at maximizing our human experience. And I've touched a little bit on the Adhar point, and, and so let me just um, double down on that. Like you said, the Huduma number system was a lot of copy paste from India because that happens a lot with legislation and policy making um, in Kenya. That that things happen in India and then. Um, you know, we, we have consultants, we have um, uh, uh, non-government organizations, Russian institutions that look at India and say, um, you know, India kind of looks like Kenya, big rural population, significant urban population, yeah, da, 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 let's scale it down and then let's do it in Kenya. And I think that the lessons, the, the good thing that happened with that um, cross-border uh, interaction was that we learned from what the activists and, and 
um, lawyers and scholars in India did to push back on Aadhaar, and it was integrated in the way that we pushed back on the ID system. There is on a Huduma number system, sorry. There is no reason why Kenya should uh, repeat the mistakes that have been made across the border. And, and so it was a really good, uh, across the Indian Ocean, sorry. And I think it was a really good instance of South-South collaboration and South-South knowledge exchange that um, um, sort of, it hit the right notes. It would have been much more difficult if we had been relying on collaborations with Europe and collaborations with North America because the legal legislative social framework um, is completely different. I hope that there can be more South-South collaborations in this vein. I hope that we can see much more um, uh, exchange of information, exchange of ideas between India and Myanmar and, and Kenya and South Africa and Nigeria and all of these countries where this idea of digital will fix all of these things that everything else has failed to fix for the last 60, 70, 100 years. I hope that we'll see much more collaboration and knowledge exchange in that regard because the problem has always been that ideas deployed in you know, the Washington consensus, you know, ideas that are designed in boardrooms and offices in Washington, DC, get rolled out in the developing world. And because India doesn't know what's happening in Kenya and Kenya doesn't know what's happening in Brazil, then activists in Kenya and India don't realize that the problem is coming until it's too late. Thankfully, the world is changing. And this was just one example of how South South collaborations can actually benefit um, everybody. I hope I've answered your question. I don't know if I have. No, that's excellent. And we are um, really running out of time, but I have one final quick question, if that's okay. Um, hmm. what, to what extent do you think the push for digital identity is about trying to capture and monetize the so-called informal economy? In Kenya, they're not even pretending. Like it's front and center, <laughs> front and center of the agenda that once we capture this information, we can sell specialized financial products and we can we quote unquote, you know, bank the unbanked and, and we can provide financial services. It, it's not even, it's, it's not hidden. It's actually front and center of the policy making in, in Kenya. And I think that, um, you know, the thing is, I have, there's nothing wrong with providing financial services. There's nothing wrong with, with allowing people to access um, money and, and credit uh, if they want, if that's what they want. Um, what I raise a red flag on is when the, when the government turns at the data that they collect, and there've been activists who've been raising the flag about this in India, when the government takes data that we provide in order to you know, because of this promise of governance and efficiency and whatever, and then monetizes that. And there's been, there's reason to believe that this, this is a credible threat. And there's reason to believe that these, uh, you know, when that phrase, data is a new oil, if you look at how, um, for example, I was looking at the government's AI policy, the Kenya government's AI policy, and you look at how we are, um, the government is basically arguing that the next step after we capture all of this data is to apply the tools of AI and to apply the tools of um, blockchain and all of these things in order to achieve the efficiency. Because that's that's what's embedded in the efficiency argument is how. You know, they'll say we'll collect the data and we'll make the government efficient. And you're like, well, how? And so the, the, the how that the government has put on the table so far is AI and blockchain and all of these um, uh, emerging technologies. And to me, I think that that is a problem because we don't provide data to the government so that the government can make money off of it. That is exploitation. That is, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's in the same way that if you did it with a corporation, it would be a problem, right? That's why we're having this problem with advertising on social media. That's how we're having this problem with uh, political manipulation on social media is that you don't give your information to Twitter or Facebook so that they can then sell it and, and make a profit off of it. You give it so that you can keep in touch with your friends and so that you can talk to your friends. And we're already seeing with these social media how that logic uh, eventually leads to harm because that unchecked data collection gives the corporation disproportionate power to um, influence political behavior, to influence political decision making, to influence access to resources, to influence access to opportunities. Like it just, it's the kind of power that you don't want the government to have. And it's the kind of power that you don't want a single institution to have. 
So I think that there is definitely reason to be concerned about monetization of, of citizen data. We, we, there, the, you look at the, the, the social security system um, in the United States, in Canada, in, in parts of Europe is always held up as, this is why we wanna do this, this is where we wanna go. But anybody who has ever had a social security number, anybody who has ever had access to those resources know that the legislative uh, context of those systems is that that information cannot be monetized that information cannot be used for anything other than that identity. Governments like Kenya, governments like India are not, are not making that um, uh, commitment. They want to keep that door open. And I think that's a red flag that we should pay attention to. Thanks, uh, Nanjala. And that is a nice uh, ending point, I think, for today's uh, conversation. Uh, we, sh we should wrap up and let people uh, go on with, uh, with the rest of their yeah. uh, day. I, I think um, we might be able to sort of turn, our, uh, turn on our cameras at the end of this uh, Mate, conversation. I took off my blazer. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I gotta put my blazer on. <laughs> I, I didn't want to put you on the, on the spot there, but just- There you go. <laughs> let me say, uh, <laughs> let me say thanks, uh, Nanjala, for a great conversation. And uh, to our audience, thanks for, for tuning in. Um, I very much enjoyed, once again, your ability to sort of pierce through hypes, including the hype around digital ID, and also the ability to sort of put uh, Huduma Namba in a proper historical perspective and underline the many sort of messy realities of implementing such an ambitious and, and complicated, controversial, and often misguided political uh, project. Uh, and also just to say that I'm glad that despite peak internet traffic in Nairobi at this uh, time of day, uh, we could still hear your brilliant remarks uh, almost 99% of the time, I would say. Uh, and that underlines, I think, there were not just data points, as you said, but uh, apparently we're also at the mercy of internet speeds yeah. in, uh, in, in Kenya. Um, I just wanted to reiterate to uh, our audience members that this conversation has been recorded and will also soon be made available on, uh, on YouTube. And once the recording is available, uh, we will also publish a brief blog trying to summarize the richness, which is prob probably impossible of today's conversation. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say when you visit our webpage, uh, please also check out a recent blog by Negozi Inamanta titled Digital Identification and Inclusionary Delusion in West Africa, which is a great title. Uh, and that's a blog dealing with some of the same issues as we discussed today, but then from the perspective of um, uh, Western Africa. Uh, and then finally, please join us for our next conversation in uh, this Transformer State series, uh, which will happen on the 20th of November. And I'm very glad to announce that we'll then be joined by uh, Australian anthropologist Eve Vincent, uh, with whom we'll have a conversation about the cashless debit card trials in Australia. Uh, again, and, uh, thanks so much and, uh, and, and hope to see you soon. And thanks to our audience for, uh, for checking in.